the research is very clear on this. It doesn't matter what you read. What matters is how much you read. It doesn't matter if you're reading James Joyce or mm -hmm. James and the Giant Peach. People who read more read better. The little boy right. who only reads Captain Underpants is going to become a better reader than the little boy who refuses to read anything. I mean, Captain Underpants mm -hmm. is the gateway drug to Shakespeare, but you got to get him hooked first. Hi, Danny. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Terry. Thanks so much for your grace. Your, your listeners have to know <laughs> that I was late for the interview. I was getting my hair cut. I was all excited to see you, and I had a long time, so I apologize. Well, your hair looks great. Good. Thank you. And, uh, and it happens. We're all good. <laughs> We're all good. So, you know, I'm really interested to hear about what you do, and I'm fascinated by what you do. And, uh, and it seems to me like you're on a mission. So why don't we start with, with that? What is your mission, Danny? Awesome. Thank you, Terry. Well, my mission is to bring joy back into education in the workplace. And I do that in four different ways. First of all, I speak over 100 dates a year all over the world, primarily to schools, parent associations and corporations, re-energizing yeah. people and reminding them why they do what they do. Second of all, I have the world's top reading engagement program online, which uh, trains parents in just over two months how to get their kids to read more, read better, and most mm -hmm. importantly, to love reading. Because I find, Terry, that schools do an adequate job of teaching kids how to read. But the question mm -hmm. I always ask people is, what good is it teaching a kid how to read if they never want to read? I right. teach kids why to read because I've never had to tell a kid, go watch TV. I've never had to tell a kid to play a video game, and I never want to have to tell a kid, go read. I want them to choose to do it because they love it, and there's simple strategies I share with uh, people to show them ways to do that. Third of all, I work with entrepreneurs, executives, and business owners on how to inf expand their influence uh, uh, and to get their audiences to take the next step, whether that's to purchase their product or to uh, donate to their cause or even just to invest in their idea. And then finally, uh, I'm the North American CEO of a company called Cyber Smarties, founded in 2015 by Dermot Hudner in Ireland. It's a social media platform for kids ages 5 to 12 that teaches kids how to use social media in a positive way. So that's a lot of different pots on the, on the stove, yeah. but uh, you asked for it. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. How did you get into doing what you're doing today? Is this what you thought you'd be doing? So, so, Terry, I have a, a photograph of me when I was four years old wearing space boots, a San Diego Chargers jersey, a sheriff's badge, and a fireman's helmet because I thought I was going Amazing. to be the first ever astronaut, professional football player, police officer, and firefighter. Uh, <laughs> That's the world I grew up in, which I was very blessed to have parents that always encouraged me. That Their only requirement was that I always did my best at whatever I did. Uh, so the, the short answer to your question is no. I had no idea I'd be doing this. <laughs> Fair enough. So how did you get into doing what you're doing today? Well, I mean, uh, to be honest, uh, in 2005, my wife and I attended a real estate seminar, which turned out to be a scam, and we lost everything. And I could focus on all the negatives, but I like to focus on the positives. And so um, um, my wife, she's my life mate. Uh, I put her through the ringer, and she stuck right by me. Uh, secondly, Amazing. I'm no longer so obsessed with money because I realize it's just a tool, and it's, it's easy come, and it's also easy go. Third, mm -hmm. I try not to judge other people because I realize if you don't know everything about a person, you don't know anything about a person. Because if I was somebody that looked right. at what I had done and be like, you deserve that. But I, you know, you didn't really know what my intentions were and everything. Fourth, mm -hmm. I became a Christian, which I'm, I'm, I, I'm humiliated to say it took me to screw up to find Jesus. But the more I real, read the Bible, right. the more I realize I'm not the first person to come to Jesus. <laughs> I <laughs> grew up. And then finally, I was a, a university professor at the time, and my accountant wanted me to declare bankruptcy, and I really didn't want to do that. And so he said, well, you're going to have to make this much more money this year. And so I started public mm -hmm. speaking on the side, and I hit the number right on the number. Well, the next year, Terry, yeah. he gave me a much higher number, and I hit that number right on the number. And so in year three, I thought, well, maybe I should set a higher number. And basically during one of the worst economic downturns in American history, I was able to build up a speaking empire that uh, has been wonderful. And so, uh, you know, I, I was actually Incredible. speaking at an event a couple of weeks ago, and I kind of felt bad because the two speakers before me, they, they kept on saying, you need to enjoy the journey. 
and I was feeling a little facetious at the time. So I got up there and I said, you ever notice the people that say, enjoy the journey have already succeeded? I mean, when you're struggling <laughs> to make rent, are you like, man, I'm really enjoying this journey. This is, you know, the entrepreneurial journey yeah. really stinks. Uh, but I, I realized that a lot of the worst things ever to happen to me turned out to be the best things ever to happen to me. But I have that hindsight now. <laughs> Amazing. And I love that. I love that perspective of, you know, the people who say that have already, they've already done it. But when you're, you're right, when you're in it, uh, it's hard to think of it that way and to, to enjoy the journey when you're struggling. I, I love that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, now I've always heard it said that leaders are readers and that's what I'm really excited to talk to you about today is, is how do we use reading in leadership and how does it help us towards success? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if every reader is necessarily, necessarily a leader, but you can show me an effective e a leader in any uh, industry, and they're going to be an avid reader. I mean, if you look mm -hmm. at, you know, so titans of interest in, of industry like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Warren Buffett, these people read like fanatics all the time. Uh, yeah. You look at uh, the military, uh, General Schwarzkopf, uh, they said, uh, could read in four different languages and quote Shakespeare wow. voraciously. Um, you know, uh, you look in sports, uh, football coach Bill Belichick has one of the most extensive football library books uh, collections in the world. Uh, LeBron James, I could have kissed him. They showed him in the locker room before the NBA finals when he was playing for the Miami Heat. And he was reading The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. And I'm like, dude, that picture just did more mm. to get kids interested in reading than anything I can do my entire lifetime. I mean, you look wow. at entertainment, uh, even even dyslexics like Sylvester Stallone and Tom Cruise and Whoopi Goldberg, these are people that are reading mm -hmm. scripts all the time. So it's very difficult to find anybody that succeeded with that. And I, I mean, the great thing about reading is you can be mentored by people that you've never met in my life. I mean, I never met Abraham Lincoln, yeah. yet I've read all kinds of amazing books about his thought perspective, and it, it really helps me. And I, I think people are really missing out if they're uh, ignoring those potential mentors. Absolutely. Um, and when it comes to reading, what kind of books should we be reading? Like, is it as beneficial to read fiction as it is to read, say, nonfiction or mindset books? Is there is there a better way to read or better books to read for us? Yeah, so it's interesting. It depends on what you want to accomplish. I mean, uh, you know, you look at uh, presidents and what they read. Uh, I was fascinated. Bill Clinton, always uh, intense moments, always liked to just read uh, mystery novels, uh, always relaxed him. And cool. so he used uh, reading as a relaxation. A, a lot of people don't remember this, but uh, President Kennedy, when he was president, uh, a journalist asked him, well, what are you reading? I'm like, oh, I, he said, I'm, I'm reading this really cool spy novel about this guy named James Bond. Uh, <laughs> that press conference, because of that, uh, uh, MGM bought the rights to James Bond and they made the movie. So we have President Kennedy to thank for James Bond. Uh, wow. I, I like being a little bit more... Um, uh, focused on reading. Um, one of my favorite podcasts right now is one called The Founders. And all the guy does is oh, he yeah. reads books about founders and then shares everything he learned. I'm like, wow, it's an amazing. He's very specific. I mean, if you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to figure out, well, maybe I need to, to focus more on marketing. Well, then you should be reading like the books by Dan Kennedy, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Trout and Reisman. Uh, and maybe if you want to look into psychology, I mean, reading like Chip and Dan Heath, uh, reading uh, uh, the Bronfman's, uh, there's all kinds of great books out there, or sales. I mean, Robert Cialdini, his book Influence, I think is a Bible for anybody I that's an entrepreneur. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just absolutely <laughs> wonderful. So you want to be, you know, I, I don't put down people for reading fiction because fiction often gives you ideas. Uh, and it's mm -hmm. kind of like the same thing about being in a mastermind. You want to be around people who are in totally different fields, but you want to take what they're doing and figure out, well, how could I apply that to my industry? Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm I'm. Totally. I, I'm an eclectic reader. I read. Every, I have one of the top book clubs online called LazyReaders.com, uh, and the criteria right. is uh, all the book recommendations are under 250 pages for people who say um, they have no time to read. I'm like, oh, there's all kinds of great books. Actually, some of the best books <laughs> out there to read are, are short, but I'm always looking for uh, gems, 
but I, I also believe you are what you read, so read good stuff. Uh, actually, for lazy readers, it kind of bothers me because every month I give 10 book recommendations, three or four adult level, three or four young adult level, and three or four children's level books, all under 250 pages. Uh, but when I'm trying to find young adult books, you go to like a Barnes & Noble, and the young adult section is filled with books about date rape and teenage suicide and dystopian mm -hmm. future. And I'm like, no wonder teens are so stressed out. You are what you read, so read good stuff. That's why I stopped watching the news. Right. It, it doesn't serve me. It makes me see all the misery in the world. Uh, and so I think you'd be, you want to be very careful. Uh, it's, you know, uh, one of my mentors, Charlie Tremendous Jones, says, you're the same today as you will be in five years, except for two things, the people you meet and the books you read. So I always encourage all of my students, you know, be wise and surround yourself with people that lift you up and make sure you're only reading things that are going to show you the solutions, not the problems. Fantastic. Is there, um, is there a difference between if we're reading if we're reading a physical book versus an audiobook, because I know that's something my clients always ask me, like, is that okay if I'm just doing audiobooks? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I work with a lot of CEOs, and this is kind of a, a, a secret that a lot of people don't realize, is over half of the Fortune 500 CEOs are dyslexic. And wow. dyslexia is just one reading disability. All reading disabilities are curable. Dyslexia is by far and away the most undiagnosed uh, uh, reading disability out there. And the thing is, Terry, dyslexics tend to process information better with their ears than their eyes. Mm. And so that's actually one of the first strategies I share with dyslexics is turn on the Audible books. Uh, one of my mentors, Jim nice. Trelease, he wrote a great book called The Read Aloud Handbook. I think it should be mandatory in every school in America. And uh, he shows you all the research on why the single best way to improve your reading is to be read aloud to. Uh, there was actually a great study done. Uh, they had 40 pregnant women, and every night the husband would read aloud to the womb, green eggs and ham. Well, when the babies were all born, they had a graduate assistant then read aloud five different books to the babies. Every baby had a visual reaction to green eggs and ham. And oh, that's so cool. I thought that was fascinating. I mean, and I, you know, the last book I wrote, the, uh, the Leadership Begins with Motivation book I wrote, uh, yeah. this was an homage to Paul Harvey. When I was a kid, I used to listen to Paul Harvey every day. He passed away a couple of years ago at the age of 325 years old. <laughs> but uh, every day he'd come on, on the radio at 1215, he'd say, I'm Paul Harvey with the rest of the story. And the whole time you're trying to guess who's he talking about and uh, or what's the company. And so when I was a middle school teacher, I was the only teacher with no tardy students because I always started class reading a Paul Harvey story. And the kids always wanted to see who I was going to talk about that day. Cool. The problem is a lot of those Paul Harvey stories are about Sears and Roebuck. Well, today's kids mm -hmm. don't know who Sears and Roebuck are. And so the reason I wrote the Leadership Begins with Motivation book was because I wanted to give kids more contemporary examples of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Sarah Blakely. And it was fascinating. After I wrote this book, Terry, I realized, wow, completely unintentionally, so many of my examples were of white male Americans. And so the book I'm writing right now, which I'm loving, is almost completely focused on women, minorities, and international examples, because I think kids need to expand their minds and see all the possibilities out there. Well, that's amazing. That's amazing. I love that. Um, as you're, you know, as you're talking about Audible and and using that to help us become better readers, are there other tools or tips that you have for us on how we can develop a better reading habit? I know um, I asked in my Instagram followers, like, what are your, are you a reader? Are you, do you want to be a better reader in preparing for this interview? And astoundingly, all of them said, I want to be a better reader. So wow. how do we become better at reading? Well, that's good. I love that. Well, I'm going to give all of your listeners two numbers they need to focus on. The numbers are 67 and 20. These are the numbers that form the basis of my reading engagement program. So the first okay. number, 67, a lot of people tell you it takes 21 days to change a habit. To those people, mm -hmm. I say, show me the research on that. I, it's completely <laughs> fabricated. I know exactly where the number comes from. It comes from a wonderful book that everybody should read written in 1960 called Psycho-Cybernetics mm -hmm. by Dr. Maxwell Maltz. In the preface of that book, Dr. Maltz was a uh, um, plastic surgeon, and he makes the casual observation in the preface that he noticed it takes most of his patients about 21 days to get used to their new faces. 
Well, a lot of personal development oh. self-help gurus, people I respect, by the way, started taking that number and telling people it takes 21 days to change a habit. It's completely false. There is no research to support right. this. Well, back in 2009, the University of London did a habit formation study, and they determined it took anywhere from 18 to 254 days to change a habit, and the average was 66 mm. days. Well. I don't like the number 66, so I threw in a bonus day, 67, 67 <laughs> days. And it depends on the type of habit you're trying to change. So, for example, if you want to drink a glass of water before breakfast, that might take 18 days to form into a habit. But if you want to quit smoking, that's going to take 254 days to change that habit. And here's why this is important, Terry. Let's say you go on a diet, you follow it religiously, but on day 22, you fall off the wagon. Well, you blame yourself. You think you're a failure. And I'm like, but wait a sec. The research shows it takes, on average, at least three times longer to form that habit. So that's the first number I want people to remember is 67 days because my program right. is designed in just over two months. We're going to get your kid reading more. The second number is 20. So researchers were looking at what are the common characteristics of successful students around the world. They looked at the low kids, the average kids, the high kids. They found something that startled them. They couldn't believe its simplicity. It was the number of minutes spent reading outside of school. So the low kids, the 20th percentile, your F students, some of your lowest students, they average less than a minute a day reading outside of school. That didn't surprise anyone. That's probably why they're at the bottom of the class. Right. But the next number did surprise mm -hmm. the researchers. The kids in the middle of the class, the 70th percentile, C students, average students, they average 9.6 minutes a day reading outside of school. And so if I'm doing a live training okay. with parents, this is when the room gets real quiet and the first hand raises and the parent says, wait a sec, are you saying if I can get my kid to read 10 minutes a day, I can take them from an F to a C? That's exactly what I'm saying. There is a lot of research oh. to support this, but the next number totally blew them away. The kids in the 90th percentile, your A minus students, some of your top students, do they spend three hours a day reading outside of school? No. Do they spend one hour a day reading outside of school? No. The average was just over 20 minutes a day. 20 minutes a day for all of your listeners that want to get better. We're trying yeah. to get 20 minutes. And here's what's great. Two things I want to encourage them with. You already hit upon one. First of all, we know being read aloud to is just as effective as reading on your own. So if you don't have time to read on your own, let's say you're, you're driving your kids to school each day. It's a 10-minute trip both ways. Put in the Audible book. You just covered your 20 minutes just going back and forth to school. And second right. of all, and I just kind of alluded to that, the minutes don't have to be consecutive. So you can do two minutes here, three minutes there. And so that's the entire basis of my program. I'm just trying to show people, well, here's ways to incorporate reading. Mm -hmm. So here, here's one for your listeners. I'll give you a gem right now. President Bush Sr. signed a very important law in America over 30 years ago. It says every television set in America has to have closed captioning. First suggestion I always tell people, turn on the closed captioning. And people always say, wait a sec, if the show is in English and the subtitles are in English, what good does that do? I'm like, well, that's a fair point, but let me make a point. Have you ever watched a show with subtitles and not looked at the subtitles? It is very difficult no. to do. Your brain is actually <laughs> directed toward the text. And there's actual research that supports this. If you look at reading test scores around the world, the exactly. more kids watch TV, the lower their reading scores are in every country on the planet except for one. The kids that watch the most TV in the world also have the highest reading scores in the world. It's Finland. And people always ask, well, how can that be? And mm -hmm. I'm like, well, because Finland makes really bad TV shows. And so what they do, <laughs> they have to import all these old American sitcoms like Gilligan's Island and Brady Bunch, and they're subtitled and finished. The kids are reading all the time. It's one of the easiest wow. strategies you can do to incorporate some extra reading all the time. I mean, I I always love going to the gym because I'll just have on my my uh, – my uh, iPhone, my iPod, I don't even know what you, my earbuds or whatever, and I'm listening to podcasts or I'm listening to uh, books on uh, audible books. I was just, I just listened to uh, Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey. He narrates oh, a, great a one. fantastic book to listen to, um, even though he's he, even though uh, he he's had a, a nightmare uh, a couple of years. Will Smith, his his autobiography is mm -hmm. also fascinating. He he narrates mm -hmm. that. I, I I tend to prefer the authors to narrate them, but it, there's an example of fiction. Uh, the Harry Potter Audible books were narrated by Jim Dale. I think he does like 133 different voices. It's one of the most amazing wow. acting performances ever. And so these are things, I, they're simple, 
this is just everything about this is what I love about uh, Darren Hardy's book, uh, The Compound Effect, is he's mm -hmm. making very simple suggestions that any entrepreneur can can do. And this is what I always point out to people. Resolutions fail. Routines work. You know, most right. New Year's resolutions are dropped by January 15th. But by incorporating some simple little things every single day, it's called habit stack. And you'll see, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, James Clear, his book, Atomic Habits, talks about it, yeah. which Atomic Habits pretty much cracks me up because most of that book is based on the research of Charles Duhigg in his book, The Power of Habit, oh, uh, yeah. which, you know, is fascinating. But basically what they're saying is if you really want to create a new habit, stack it with a different habit. So, for example, mm -hmm. I have a, a rule for myself. I'm trying to get in better shape. And so when I go on my exercise bike, there's a, a TV show that I love. And I'm only allowing myself to watch it when I'm on the bike. And so now I have a reason to go on the bike because I want to watch the TV show. And that's what we're trying to, you know, another thing I do, I have three kids and my wife. Um, and so I have dates with all of them every day, every single day where I have specific books with each of them. And so my oldest daughter, wow. she's into Game of Thrones. And so we're reading uh, Fire and Ice by George R. R. Martin. My son is always into military history. So right now we're reading Master and Commander by Patrick O'Brien. And then nice. my, for some reason, my youngest daughter, she loves literature. It drives me nuts. Uh, so we're reading <laughs> The Great Gatsby, which I hate that book. But, uh, the more I read it, I'm like, okay, I still hate the story, but the way he writes is beautiful. Uh, that's yeah. Tom Fitzgerald. And then my wife, um, gosh, we have this wonderful series of books. This uh, author, Beth Brower, uh, the unselected journals of Emma M. Lyon. These are like the nicest books. It's her and th three guys in the, you know, uh, like Elizabethan time. It's just wonderful. I absolutely love, I'm like, it's such a nice, pleasant series. Uh, you know, I, and I tell this to people, you are what you read. So read good stuff. I mean, if you read, this is why when you're reading the newspaper, you usually have to take a shower afterwards because you're so depressed. You know, I, I, I read things that are going to, inspire me and sometimes i'll read a book because yeah. i'm always looking for stories um i just read a book and the whole book stunk but there was one little story in it and i'm like Oof, it was worth reading the entire book just for this one little story so sorry i, I give long answers to short questions oh, but i love it all those people that want to read better <laughs> there's really simple strategies and it, again it's nothing i'm never going to overwhelm people with this uh mm -hmm. you, if you can just incorporate and make them into habits that's how you're going to have long-term success yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much for that. And, and I love that you talked about the 20 minutes a day, because I think I know for myself, I think if I don't have like, hours to sit down and read, then it doesn't seem worthwhile. And so I, f I think you just let a lot of people off the hook yeah. and made it very simple. So, so thank you for that. Absolutely. Well, and I mean, most people, you know, most people with their cell phones, they waste time. They're on social media all mm -hmm. the time. But I'm like, you know, when used properly, this is an effective teaching tool. And so, like, I'm always trying to learn different things because I'm not that bright. And so, uh, <laughs> like, uh, I had read the book Dune by Frank Herbert. And there's a thing in that which actually you know, entrepreneur, entrepreneurs would like it. It's called The Litany Against Fear. And it's this uh, motto that uh, the main character, Paul Atreides, keeps on saying in his head. He's like, I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over and through me. And when it is passed, I will turn the evil eye to see its path. Uh, where the fear was, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. I do that all. I'm doing that because I'm like, oh, it's encouraging. And I'm trying to learn yeah. it. Um, I'm trying. I love the poem Invictus by William Ernest Henley. I had seen the movie Invictus with Matt Damon and Morgan Freeman. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. And so uh I'm trying to learn this one. Every morning at 5 a.m. I go through it. It's out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole. I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloodied but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. See, I've gotten it, but I've been I practicing that. that for like the last month. Um, I'm a bad Christian. I'm always trying to learn scripture. And so like, uh, you know, Philippians 4.8, every day at 4.08, I go through um, uh, for 
finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So I've been practicing that. Wow. Um, every day, my, my wife and I got married on December 20th. So every day at 1220, I have a reminder to, to write my wife a note that I love her. You know, but so Aww. this is how you're incorporating reading every single day in a positive way. Now, social media, yeah, that's the same. You can use social media that way. Like on my Twitter feed, I only have like positive people. The moment a person mm -hmm. says anything political or anything negative, they're gone. I'm like, that's nice. my rule on all social media. Now, I have no interest. I don't care. You know, I learned long ago. That's like one of yeah. my favorite quotes. It's like when you're 18, you care what everybody thinks about you. When you're 40, you don't care what anybody thinks about you. <laughs> and when you're 60, you realize nobody was thinking about you. <laughs> I love that because I realized, you know, I don't think anybody gives a hoot what my political beliefs are. <laughs> so why, no. why do they think I'm going to care about theirs? So what I'm listening, there's some great feeds I'm, I'm watching about, you know, I'm trying to learn art. So there's painters that I'll, I'll follow and try and learn, nice. or there's like, um, little moments in history and it gives you like a little background. I'm like, Oh, mm -hmm. these are cool. Cause again, I'm looking for those stories, but that's how yeah. everybody in your audience, you know, people, when they think reading, this is what I always emphasize to people. The research is very clear on this. It doesn't matter what you read. What matters is how much you read. It doesn't matter if you're reading James Joyce or mm -hmm. James the Giant Peach. People who read more read better. The little boy right. who only reads Captain Underpants is going to become a better reader than the little boy who refuses to read anything. I mean, Captain Underpants mm -hmm. is the gateway drug to Shakespeare, but you got to get him hooked first. And so right. all these people that think reading means reading Dostoevsky, no. If you get a kick out of reading the sports page every day, read the sports page every day. If you like reading Good Housekeeping magazine, read Good Housekeeping magazine. It's still print. You know, uh, right. I was with a fourth grade teacher and she told me this kid doesn't know how to read. I spent an hour with this boy and Terry in one hour, the kid must have texted 15 people. He was he was surfing the Internet. He was sending an email I'm like he's highly literate. She is using a definition mm -hmm. from 75 years ago. And so it's when I hear people say a literacy yeah. crisis today, I'm like, I guarantee you in a single day, human beings in America are exposed to more print in a single day than a person living in the 19th century saw their entire lifetime. So I'm not worried about wow. that. But what I am worried about is we force people to read certain things and we, we give them mm -hmm. definitions. It's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, saying, oh, I'm going to do something cultural tonight. I'm going to go to the opera. I'm like, well, that's cultural. But so is going to a monster truck rally. That's also cultural. I mean, right. you know, let's expand the definition there. Uh, Walt Whitman has a great quote. He said, uh, be curious, not judgmental. And we'd be nice. much better off as a society. This is where the political problems dr drive me crazy. I'm like, stop yelling at one another. You're not going to learn. I have a yes. post-it on my desk right here, Terry. It says, what if I'm wrong? <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> the truth. I mean, 1,800 years ago, we knew the earth was flat. 500 years ago, we knew that the sun revolved around the earth. 100 years ago, we knew humans could never fly. I mean, what, uh, what do we know mm -hmm. right now? <laughs> right. Right. Absolutely. And yeah, I love, I love hearing you talk about that and about the, um, the example you gave of that boy. Cause that reminds me when I was three or not three, when I was in grade three, uh -huh. I stopped reading completely. I refused to read. And then one day my teacher brought me a play. She was trying to find something that interested me. She brought me a play to read and I devoured it. And then by the time I was 10, I was reading Shakespeare because oh. I was, and, and I became an actor for quite a while. Like nice. I became a professional actor, but that's What's what What's your favorite Shakespearean then. play? Oh, you know, it's so hard to pick, but I love King John. Oh, wow. That's one of my, cool. that's one of my favorites. Um, yeah, I love it. There's a monologue in it by Lady Constance that just, it's so gripping. I love it. And it's, you know, and then you just said, like. I find that little girls, like I'll ask a little girl, what was your favorite book uh, growing up? And they'll usually say like Nancy Drew, because like, you had a right. strong, 
That's why the Harry Potter books are so amazing is because, yes, you have Harry Potter, but you also have Hermione Granger, who's also a strong character. And I think yeah. kids need to see those characters all the time. That's love. I mean, I I had that same thing. I hated reading growing up. My father was a librarian. I always hated the life. I hated, you know, the only thing I read was TV Guide when I was a kid. I remember in high yeah. school, my teacher made us read uh the Scarlet Letter by uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne. And no offense to the people that love this oh, book, yeah. but uh, the book is about Hester Prynne commits adultery. And mm -hmm. so she's forced to wear an A on her chest. And I raised my hand and I asked yeah. my teacher if I could wear a B on my chest because I was so bored reading this <laughs> book. And I, I, I love that your third grade teacher found something you were interested in. That's the key because yes. by getting you interested in it, then you're going to do it. And we know it's the man, it's, it's those minutes that matter, making it into that mm -hmm. habit. You know, uh, the reason we have a lot of obese kids is because PE class was like climb the rope and run laps. It wasn't like fun yeah. stuff. Uh, and again, it's really basic psychology. For all the entrepreneurs, like don't do things you don't like because you won't stick to them. Find other people mm -hmm. to do those things. Figure out what you're good at <laughs> and make that your service. And then surround yes. yourself with a team of, you know, because some people, they love doing taxes. Well, so I have a person that does my taxes. You know, some right. people just love uh, writing uh, copy uh, for marketing copy. Well, I'll, I'm going to hire a person that loves doing that. Like, figure out what you're good at. You know, it's my, my wife a couple of weeks ago, our toilet broke, and she, she asked me to fix it. And so I called the plumber. And she's like, I asked you to fix it. I'm like, I did fix it. I called the plumber. He fixed it very quickly and only cost me this much money. If I had done it, it would have taken forever. It would have been done incorrectly. Mm -hmm. And it probably would have cost more money. She's like, that costs a lot yeah. of money. I'm like, I charge a lot of money for what I do. I'm really good at what I do. And I pay other people a lot of money because they're good at what they do. People are crazy. Yeah. People are silly to me. <laughs> oh, I agree. Definitely. Definitely. You have... um. You have a gift for the, the listeners today. Do you want to tell them about? Yeah, if you, about as, you a, as a thank you for bearing you, Terry, and all your listeners uh, paying attention to me today, I wanted to give everybody a couple of freebies. So if you go to freegiftfromdanny.com, again, freegiftfromdanny.com, I'm going to give everybody a complimentary e-copy of my book, Read, Lead, and Succeed. This is a book I wrote for an elementary school principal who was trying to keep his faculty and staff positively mm -hmm. engaged. So I said, okay, I'll write you a book. So every week I give you a concept an inspirational quote, an inspirational story, cool. a book recommendation on a book you should read, but you're probably too lazy because you're an adult. So I also give you a children's picture book recommendation, demonstrates the same concept. You can read that in five minutes. Nothing turns me on more than watching CEOs start their meetings with Dr. Seuss. Uh, I'm awesome. also going to give everybody access to a five-day reading challenge I did last summer with about 700 parents around the world, where every day for an hour for five consecutive days, I give you all kinds of strategies to get kids more excited about reading because the more excited you are to read, the more likely you are to read, and the more you read, the better you get. So that's all at freegiftfromdanny.com. I really just wanted to thank you, first of all, for your patience with me, Terry, but second of all, oh, no you're part of the solution. Like this is what your listeners, they're ahead of everybody else. Most people are just focused on the problems and that doesn't advance anybody. We need to be part of the solution we need to be able to learn how to disagree without being disagreeable. We need to surround ourselves yeah. with positive things that uh, keep us focused on uh, possibilities. And I, I really appreciate you having a podcast that does those things. Well, thank you. I appreciate that so much. Uh, now I'm going to go through my, this is something new that I just started, but I have a set of rapid fire questions. Uh -oh. So if you'll indulge me in going through them, it's just to help our audience just get to know you better and, and who the person is behind all, right. all of this. I hate to ask you this first one, but I'm going to anyway. Do you have a favorite book? Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> um, you know what? I'll, I'll, I will give you a book for each age level since I, I talked about it on Lazy. So adult, Excellent. adult level book, I will say The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams was the first book where I had to stop reading it because I was laughing out loud so hard. It was just, It's a short book. Oh, nice. 150 pages. Wonderful. Wonderfully humorous. Um, middle school, this is going to sound weird, but gosh... I still think To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee is just what a lovely mm -hmm. book. I absolutely, mm -hmm. I love Scout, the character, and I think Atticus Finch is a 
a moral. I would vote for Atticus Finch for president any day. That's the person you want leading your country. Yeah. Just a wonderfully written book. And then for uh, little kids, uh, Where the Wild Things Are by Marie Sendak. Oh, yeah. uh, I love that book because it was about a mischievous boy named Max. And I was a mischievous boy. I love the pictures. I don't know why as we become adults, they stop putting pictures in books. I love the pictures. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's three for you. Long answer to the short rapid fire question. <laughs> Perfect. I, I love that. Favorite food? Favorite food is fried chicken. <laughs> nice. Uh, what's your biggest pet peeve? Biggest pet peeve are uh, people that cut me off on the freeway. But now my habit is when they oh, yeah. cut me off, I pray they make it to the hospital on time. <laughs> I love that. Who inspires you? Um, well, you, uh, anybody that's part of the solution. There's a lot of most. That's why I don't watch the news or read the news any days because it's focused on all the negatives of society. But I, that's only about a, a very small segment. Most pe I, I, I get to go to the most liberal and most conservative places on the planet. And, you know, people aren't Fox News or MSNBC. People are really good people. And uh, so actually I'll say uh, a TV show, CBS Sunday Morning, uh, is just nothing but positive. When I, I, I was a journalist before I was a, oh, a cool. teacher, and I wanted to be the next Charles Corral, and instead they put me on the political beat, which was like, torture for me but i love uh, there's a, a reporter on cbs sunday morning steve hartman and he always does those uplifting stories about uh regular people doing extraordinary things that nobody notices but uh it's what makes nice. this the greatest country on the planet oh that's great uh three things you would take with you to a deserted island oh dear uh i would take <laughs> the uh, complete works of william shakespeare uh I would take the Bible um, mm -hmm. and I would take a book on uh, how to escape a deserted island. <laughs> <laughs> smart. Very smart. And if you could have dinner with any celebrity dead or alive, who would you choose? Oh, gosh. You know, okay, so I'm just going to go first thing in my head. This is going to sound weird. It would probably be Steven Spielberg. I, I, I'm just oh. so, he's always inspired me. I'm, and I, I think he's just completely underrated. I, I, I look at when he started his career, it was all science fiction, mm -hmm. but he's made movies like Lincoln, which is incredible. He made Catch Me If You Can, which yeah. is a funny kind of movie. West Side Story, I was angry when they remade that because that's one of my favorite movies. And I watched his remake and I'm like, oh my gosh, he did it better. It's, it's, and yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. I, yeah, that's, that's who I'd say. Perfect. And go to karaoke song. <laughs> karaoke uh my way by frank sinatra <laughs> oh fantastic choice great well thank you so much for being here before we close off do you have any last thoughts you want to share with the listeners uh, you know i i all those people i first of all i'm just so impressed that your audience they wanted to learn how to read better I'm, and it doesn't take that much it really doesn't mm -hmm. uh i was not a reader the only reason i became a reader was i taught in the inner city and when I saw my students right. didn't have a lot of the advantages I had growing up, I said, shame on me. And, you know, I was blessed. I had both of my parents in the home. We weren't wealthy, but we also always had food on the table. And my parents always read in front of us kids, to us kids. And I had plenty of access to reading materials. Oh, yeah. And for that person out there that feels like it's helpless, there's this great government program in almost every community. They got these buildings. And in these buildings are rows and rows of books. And get this. All you have to do is apply for a card and they'll let you take these books home. They're called public libraries. And <laughs> uh, I would encourage anybody and especially the people that are trying to to in, improve their reading. You said something really important earlier, uh, Terry. You don't have to read for an hour. You, you read mm -hmm. when you can. You have you find those times in your day. I like to start off my I, I have a. Uh, a prayer journal. I've been, I'm in the 11th round of reading it again. And every day it's oh, like wow. a, a quick little five minute read, but it's inspiring. Um, I, I look for inspiring things to read because I'm a big believer in uh, you become what you think about. Uh, they say garbage in, garbage out. And I don't believe that. I think garbage in, garbage stays. And mm. I think it's really important to, to be very critical of and very, very intentional of, of reading things that are positive. Um, you know, life's too short yeah. and uh, people aren't as different as a lot of people like to think that. So uh, that would be my advice. Uh, I, 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 I'm so, 
so grateful that I'm a reader now. Uh, I just wish I could read faster because there's so many books I I want to read and it kill. I, yeah. I made the mistake of going into a bookstore the other day with a friend and an hour and a half later, I'd bought 12 books and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, they could have been cheaper on Amazon, but I'm like, oh, these are, it's a physical bookstore. I don't want physical bookstores to leave. And uh, I loved it. Um, but it doesn't have to be anything grandiose. I mean, if you want to read comic books, read comic books. Uh, you know, that's actually nice. kind of a good idea. I read a lot of graphic novels to because the teens are always asking. I have three teenagers; they're always asking me for graphic novels. Mm -hmm. um, and they, the the cool thing with graphic novels is they'll take like real like literature and make them into graphic novels. So you can read like if you don't want to read Oliver right. Twist, well, you can read Oliver Twist the graphic novel. If you don't want to read Pride and Prejudice, cool. read Pride and Prejudice the graphic novel. Uh, but I really want your listeners to understand it's baby steps. Just, just try, mm -hmm. if you can get those 20 minutes and if you can't get 20 minutes right now, I'll tell you what, 10 minutes is better than no minutes. So don't be right. so critical with yourself. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here today. Thank you, Terry. Thank you so much for having me. God bless.